Okay, so this first lecture of vascular pathology is basically going to be about vasculitis. But before that, I just wanted to give a general uh, overview or uh, a general background about blood vessels and their histology. So vascular, of course, it refers to blood vessels, right? And we know that we have three types of blood vessels in the body, arteries, veins and capillaries. Now arteries are muscular. They are muscular because they have to withstand the pressure with which the blood is being pumped from the heart. And they also have to maintain that pres pressure so they are elastic as well. Secondly, we have veins which are not that muscular and their compliance is uh, very high. And lastly, we have the capillaries which are single layered and very fine thin vessels which are basically responsible for diffusion of both gases and nutrients across the vessel wall into the tissues. Now here we have this blood vessel and to know about the structure of the vessel wall in the case of both arteries and veins we are going to see what layers make up the vessel wall. Now in both arteries and veins we have the same three layers tunica intima, tunica media and tunica adventitia but the difference occurs where there is a difference in the thickness of uh, each of these walls. So, regarding the tunica intima, which is the innermost layer, we, we go from the innermost layer to the outermost layer by going downwards. And in the tunica intima, we have uh, the endothelium, first of all, which is basically a simple squamous epithelium. Then we have a basal lamina and a subendothelial layer. In between the intima and media, we're going to have an internal elastic lamina. And as I said, that arteries are elastic. Why? Because they have to maintain the pressure in in the arterial wall, uh, even during diastole. The tunica media is chiefly composed of smooth muscles, and this is of course um, required because arteries can contract and relax on their own by the autonomic uh, supply that they have. Um, also veins can also do that. After that, between the tunica media and adventitia, we are going to have the external elastic lamina. The adventitia is the outermost layer and it is collagenous and elastic. Now one thing to remember is that tunica adventitia has visa visorum. These are basically vessels of the vessels. Mm, that that's what it means so uh, what happens is that b if we have this uh, blood vessel here so this is the blood vessel wall right so if uh, these three layers are uh, these are the three layers so the blood which is flowing uh, inside the vessel wall is going to supply some of the uh, the intima and the media but but uh, some of the diffusion cannot occur through this wall. So we have these visa visorum, which are going to supply these outermost parts or the adventitia and part of the media of the vessel wall. That's why they are present. Okay. So these are basically vessels of the vessels. Okay. So next we have nervi vascularis. These are autonomic uh, nerves which supply the blood vessels and thus are responsible for the uh, contraction and relaxation of these vessels to maintain the diameter of the lumen. And lastly this adventitia is going to merge with the connective tissue in which the vessel will run. Here we have um, a diagram of a capillary in which we can see endothelial cells and uh, the basal lamina is not shown but these are squamous endothelial cells. Okay so this is a histological picture of an artery and a vein. You can see here that we have all the three layers, intima, media and adventitia. The elastic, internal elastic lamina can be seen here because arteries are more elastic and also they are more muscular. So the media and or the smooth muscle layer, you can see that it is more thick than in the vein. So coming to our main topic for this video, it is vasculitis plural will be vasculitis. So we can see that vascule here in the name refers to vessel and itis means 
inflammation of course so what does vasculitis cause what does it basically result in in our body or what damage does it cause first of all as we know that vasculitis is a form of inflammation and inflammation whenever there is inflammation or in our body there are some general symptoms for to watch out for which give a clue that there is something wrong within the body which basically occurs due to inflammation and tissue damage so these general symptoms will be fever malaise which is general uh, weakness or fatigue myalgias muscle pain and arthralgias which are joint pains and also in case of vasculitis there are going to be some specific symptoms now these specific symptoms will occur due to um the downward ischemia that is going to happen due to this vasculitis now why this do- downward ischemia occurs is because regardless of the cause of the vasculitis regardless of the etiology what will happen is that uh, there will be uh, even if it is an injurious cause or an infectious cause what will happen is that we know that we have endothelial cells lining the vessel wall and whenever there is an injury uh, to this wall two processes are triggered first we can uh, we are going to have a coagulation cascade so that a blood clot is formed to in order to prevent bleeding and secondly there is also inflammation so both these processes the first the coagulation cascade is going to cause thrombosis and the second process the inflammation is going to cause vessel injury and repair and we know that repair uh, is going to cause fibrosis and fibrosis decreases diameter and so does thrombosis so both these processes what they will do is that they will decrease the lumen of the vessel and thus the whatever organ that vessel is supplying that is going to cause pain in the start and if the lumen diameter is further decreased it will undergo infarction which is due to tissue death coming to the classification of these vasculitides now in order to classify them we can uh, we can see that we have a lot of options on on the basis of which we can classify them but the most uh, easiest or or the most popular one is according to the vessel size and that's what we are going to do here and that is classified as small medium and large vessel vasculitides secondly we can classify them on the basis of vessel si- site uh, so as to say that which vessels it mainly affects for example they can be the coronary vessels they can be the cranial vessels um, and uh, etc we can also classify them on the basis of lesion histology that is whatever the vasculitis occurs the lesion of the vasculitis is it uh, primarily neutrophilic is it granulomatous is it lymphocytic or eosinophilic we can also classify it on the basis of clinical manifestations as to which uh, organ or which um, whichever part of the body undergoes ischemia and damage in this vasculitis because of course vessels supply um, body organs right we can also classify them on the basis of pathogenesis as um, of which route it is going to choose to cause that tissue damage and vasculitis okay so on the basis of etiology of these vasculitides we can classify them to be infectious or non infectious now infectious causes are not that common they can be bacterial or fungal or viral and the two important uh, fungi that are responsible for this uh, infectious causes are aspergillus and mucor now what these will result in they'll be the same the results will be the same as any uh, vasculitides but the fact is that these will be septic that is they will be uh, infected so the thrombus thrombi or emboli will be septic that is they, they will be infected mycotic aneurysms simply means that the etiology will be different the vessel wall inflammation will still be there and then the vessel media or the smooth muscle layer that will be damaged this, that will undergo apoptosis or necrosis and thus the vessel wall will be weakened resulting in the formation of aneurysms that is abnormal vessel dilatations of the wall and also thrombosis we have discussed that already now coming to the non infectious causes the non infectious causes can be uh, immune related they can be related to injury such as we've discussed already the 
uh, injury can be physical or chemical in nature chemical uh, injury can be radiation trauma or toxins etc now among all of these the non infectious immune mediated causes are the most common one and these will uh, these are the ones we will discuss in this video so as as i've said that uh, all of these can be the basis of classification but the most uh, widely accepted one is on the basis of vessel size and that is what we'll discuss here coming to the pathogenesis of vascular disease now as i already described that the infectious and injurious causes um, can be one of the causes of vascular disease and what happens is that this pathogenesis is pretty simple you can understand that any any uh, foreign agent such as a virus bacteria or fungi what happens is that it is going to cause uh, endothelial injury that will cause coagulation and uh, which can then cause thrombosis and the same mechanisms as we discussed before and the vessel wall it will also undergo inflammation and repair causing fibrosis and thus uh, the lumen will be uh, more narrow and thus the same results will be there now this now this specific immune mediated causes we have to study these in a bit detail so if we have immune mediated etiologies of these vas vasculitides what will happen is that we can go about it in three different ways one of the immune uh, immune mediated causes can be immune complex mediated vasculitis now what is an immune complex immune complex means uh, an antigen and antibody complex okay so this antigen can be any antigen uh, the body can be hyper reacting to it or it can be a foreign it invaders such as a viral protein etc these are the examples it can be dna and anti dna complex in systemic lupus erythematosus it can be a drug or a drug plus self protein uh, complex in drug hypersensitivity reactions it can be a viral protein such as uh, hepatitis b surface antigen in polyarteritis nodosa we'll discuss that uh, in a while now what i uh, mean to say here is that these immune complexes are going to be deposited in the endothelial cells and you can see here this is the immune complex which is which has been deposited what it will do is that it will um, it will activate neutrophils or it can activate the complex uh, complement system and that will in turn lead to endothelial damage how that is via cytokines cytokine release enzyme release and reactive oxygen species release and thus this will lead to endothelial damage and all the and everything that happens after that secondly these immune mediated causes can be in the form of anti neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies now these are auto antibodies okay these are auto antibodies and uh, this is a form of autoimmune disease and what what happens is in this disease uh, is that we have auto antibodies against the normal enzymes or the granules that are present in the neutroph neutrophils right so we have two types of uh, antibodies in this case first we can have anti proteinases which are also known as C anchors or cytoplasmic anti neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies okay or we can have anti mpo that is anti myeloperoxidase th this is the enzyme that is present in the uh, both the monocytes and the neutrophilic granules and uh, it is involved in the in, in the normal inflammatory process but what happens is that these auto antibodies they are formed against these or own neutrophilic granules and what happens is that when they react Mm, with these neutrophils they will undergo um, degranulation and these proteolytic enzymes and reactive oxygen species will be released and that will really uh, that will cause endothelial damage and uh, the same results as we've discussed before that will ensue after endothelial damage 
Now, lastly, we can have anti-endothelial cell mediated antibodies. Uh, and this vasculitis will occur when we have these autoantibodies which are going to be against the cell the antigens of the uh, endothelial cells uh, now we know that all of our cells we have certain proteins that are being uh, presented by our cells and those antigens that are being normally presented by the endothelial cells autoantibodies fail to recognize them as self and they will be developed against them now one of two processes can occur either they will directly or indirectly cause cytotoxicity and uh, this cytotoxicity will then uh, cause damage to the endothelium and the same process will um, undergo or what they can do is that they can increase the leukocyte adhesion and activation of uh, coagulation or the same uh, processes will occur either directly or indirectly so basically we know that the auto uh, antibodies are responsible for all this now that we know the pathogenesis of these um, vasculitides let's classify them and study each of them in detail now we know that we classified them on the basis of size right so first of all we'll have small vessel vasculitides the first one is the granul granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Wegener's granulomatosis or GPA okay so this is a small vessel vascul vasculitis so what happens is that mainly mainly it is going to affect the upper and lower respiratory tract the kidneys and the lungs and the airways that are included in upper and lower respiratory tract of course so the same pathogenesis the same etiologies but these specifically we can see that this upper airway this lower airway and the kidneys are the ones that are solely um, affected in this um, disease so if we can see here what happens is that if it affects the upper airway we can have sin sinusitis otitis media rhinitis mucosal ulcerations and uh, this is something you need to remember this can uh, also cause saddle nose deformity this is due to mucosal ulcerations and poor blood supply so over time the nose mm, sort of turns into the, sh into the shape of a saddle we can see nodules on x-ray these are lesions on x-ray we can see pulmonary infiltrates pulmonary hemorrh hemorrhage can occur pleurisy which is just the inflammation of the two uh, layers of the pleura and hemoptysis which is coughing up blood and if it affects the kidneys we can have hematuria rbc casts and necrotizing glomerulonephritis so necrotizing means that it is uh, undergoing cell death of course poor poor blood supply and glomerulonephritis means that the glomeruli are going to be inflamed okay so uh, an important diagnostic feature of uh, this Mm, Wegener's uh, granulomatosis is that there will be increased serum C ANCAS as I have described the pathogenesis of C ANCAS so we can see that this is basically the etiology for GPA or Wegener's granulomatosis the classical group of people that is affected in GPA is middle-aged males under the microscope we can see necrotizing granulomas now you know what granulomas are and why they are formed granulomas are basically formed when the body cannot eliminate or uh, a foreign a foreign antigen antibody complex or any uh, pathogen for that matter and it is going to form a granuloma and it mainly consists of uh, lymphocytes it can have macrophages it can have giant cells it can have um, eosinophils if it is allergic but this in this case it is not allergic so don't quote me on that okay so the next small vessel vasculitis is microscopic polyangiitis this simply means poly means many and angiitis means vessel um, inflammation one thing to remember is that it is not going to have granulomas under a microscope and you can remember this by the fact that its name does not contain the word granuloma although that is not the case with all of these uh, diseases so what it actually is it is necrotizing vasculitis 
involving many organs but especially lungs and kidneys now if you remember in the previous one the gpa we uh, we had kidneys lungs and upper um, nasopharyngeal involvement as well but in this case one thing to remember is that there is not going to be any nasopharyngeal involvement as you can see here in the patient it does not uh, he does not have any nasopharyngeal involvement another thing to remember is that in gpa we had raised in c anchors remember and here we we are going to have increased p anchors um, as uh, as a di we can use this as a diagnostic feature for microscopic polyangiitis. Uh, if you look at the patient here, as I said, it is going to involve the lungs and the kidneys. So in the lungs, you can see pulmonary capillary alveolitis, which is simply um, uh, alveolar inflammation, pulmonary hemorrhage, and hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood. There is also a palpable uh, purpura, the palpable um, Basically, for all the vascularities which involve uh, the skin, they are going to have palpable purpuras because uh, this is not the usual uh, purpura which is only due to a hemorrhage or pooling of the blood under the skin. This is due to vasculitis and when there is inflammation, we know that there is uh, going to have uh, that swelling and we, we are going to have a purpura which will be uh, palpable. We have posse immune glomerulonephritis. Posse immune means that the immune complexes are not that much uh, um, but still there is going to have uh, they're going to have glomerulonephritis under the microscope we're going to have fibrinoid necrosis fibrinoid um, necrosis under the microscope is uh, appears as a in a, during an H &E stain we are going to have pink a pinkish amorphous substance that is um, how necrosis looks under the microscope and fibrinoid because this vessel is going to have undergone um, fibrin deposition within the area of cell death. Secondly, we're going to have leukocytoclastic vasculitis, leuco white blood cell, cytocell, and clastic means a breakdown. So this is going to have, this vasculitis is going to have uh, neutrophil debris. We can see necrotizing glomerulonephritis and pulmonary capillaritis. All of this is simply inflammation of the structures which are involved in the organs that it chiefly affects. So moving on, we have the next small vessel vasculitis which is known as churg strauss syndrome it is also known as allergic granulomatosis and angiitis now for this one all you need to remember is that it is allergic okay so um, if we if we uh, connect all of these together we we're, we're going to have allergic allergy uh, eosinophilia and asthma so this is a way that you can remember that since it is an allergic response so people with asthma they are going to be more prone they're going to have eosinophilia and uh, that's how the disease is going to progress so it is basically a necrotizing granulomatous inflammation the name has granuloma with eosinophilia involving the lungs and the heart remember this as well lungs can be uh, remembered easily but remember this heart as well now so first we, we discussed c ncas then we had p ncas and now we have c ncas again as a diagnostic tool for this disease if you look at the patient here we are going to have uh, lung problems which are asthma if you simply remember asthma and eosinophilia and allergic uh, for chuck strauss syndrome that is enough and we are going to have sinus problems, nasal blockage that are basically upper respiratory tract problems. Uh, also we are going to have rashes and pins and needles due to uh, nerve damage. Under histology we are going to have systemic small vessel vasculitis with granulomas, uh, fibrinoid necrosis of systemic vessels, small vessels and eosinophilic infiltrates. Just uh, Chuck Strauss syndrome should ring a bell and remind you that it is concerned about eosinophilia. That's all you need to remember. The lesions, they will resemble polyarteritis nodosa, but the lesions are going to have eosinophilia and granulomas. We'll, we'll discuss PAN in a while, and then you'll understand this. Lastly, 
the last small vessel vasculitis is Henoch Schonlein purpura. Now, this vasculitis is basically an IgA mediated, um, IgA immune complex mediated vasculitis. What happens is that the chief antibody that uh, that is the causative agent for this disease is IgA. Okay, and we know that IgA is present on mucosal surfaces. So. Uh, this uh, so the uh, classical group which uh, has this disease are going to be children with a history of upper respiratory tract infection and as i said that their uh, iga is a mucosal antibody so uh, if a uh, if a child has a upper respiratory tract infection the mucosa is going to produce iga in larger quantities and then this iga and the immune complex uh, may get deposited where it shouldn't be deposited and result in henoxian line purpura this is basically a palpable purpura due to vasculitis in the skin, renal joint, uh, skin, renal and joint vessels. So this child is going to have uh, renal issues, joint pains, and this is the uh, purpural rash. This is very distinct. You can Google this image as well. And he is also going to have abdominal pain. Now the diagnostic criteria is to get a biopsy of the affected organ, and we we are going to see. IgA immune complexes uh, in the vessel walls they're, they're going to be embedded and stuck there in the stick uh, skin sorry skin we can see leukocytoclastic vasculitis this is the same that there are going to be neutrophilic debris in this and in the vessel wall we can see IgA and C3 they're going to be deposited there in the kidney we can see mesangial IgA deposition that is the kidney mesangium is going to have IgA deposited in its wall so that is all about the small vessel vasculitis now we're going to go to the medium vessel vasculitis so the first of the medium vessel vasculitis we have polyarteritis nodosa or shortly known as pan pan is basically a necrotizing vasculitis of kidneys heart liver and git now this uh, you should not remember this in this way but the only thing you should remember is that it will spare the lungs it will let you breathe but uh, doesn't let you do anything else pretty much so all of these um, organs are involved in descending order now what it is basically the etiology is an immune complex deposition in one third of the cases in the intima of the vessel wall of course and one thing to remember about pan is that mostly uh, it is associated with hepatitis b surface antigen okay so this immune complex is going to be formed by an antibody and a hepatitis b uh, antigen surface antigen okay while there can also be idiopathic and cutaneous forms which um, we are not very sure about the hist uh, etiology in this case the major uh, classic group of people that are affected by this disease are young adults and if you uh, take a biopsy from the affected side of the vessel or take a um, or and observe it under microscope what we will find is that we are going to have segmental necrotizing vasculitis for so, so for example if this is the artery we are going to have segments of necrotic areas okay so there there are two types of lesions in pan Firstly, we, we are going to have the acute lesions which are actively undergoing necrosis and inflammation is at its peak. So we'll find sharply circumscribed arterial fibrinoid necrosis with hyaline deposition which is simply it is, it, it is going to be shown as pinkish area and also with neutrophilic infiltrates. This shows that this uh, in this area there is active inflammation going on. But secondly, we are also going to have heal lesions and we know that healing process is going to cause fibrosis so there will be a fibrotic artery and this fibro uh, fibrosis uh, since the smooth muscle wall is going to be destroyed what happens is that this fibrotic artery is very prone to aneurysm formation so the next point here which can be explained by this description is that on an angiogram on an angiogram we are going to have a beading appearance so this is going to be like a string of bead appearance and here you can remember this by a pan this is a pan with a string of beads so this is uh, the appearance that is going to be shown on an angiogram 
it does not involve any ancus because uh, it is a it is simply immune complex deposition so but uh, as i said before that hepatitis b surface antigen is the cause of this um, disease in 30 percent of the cases now the complications as i described in the introduction generally they are going to be due to thrombosis aneurysms and vessel lumen diameter decrease and the clinical presentations are going to be related to the tissues involved um, it can affect the heart the kidney the liver the gi tract the skin and the so in Kawasaki's disease, we need to know that there is another name for this disease, which is mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. So many of the clinical uh, manifestations we can remember by this name, by remembering this name. Muco refers to mucous membrane, which will uh, cause oral and conjunctival erythemas here in the clinical manifestation section. Cutaneous causing skin rash, lymph nodes causing lymphadenopathy and fever because this is inflammation, right? One thing to remember about Kawasaki's disease is that the classic age group is less than four year children and commonly it is going to involve the coronary arteries leading to MI by all the mechanisms such as decreased lumen diameter um, due to fibrosis, thrombosis and aneurysms etc. The diagnosis is generally made by a physical exam and the um, under histology it is going to be same as PAN and it's not we cannot differentiate it. The etiology is due to a T cell hypersensitivity to unknown antigens. So this has nothing to do with ANCAS as well. One thing to remember about Kawasaki's disease is that its treatment involves aspirin. Now you know that we do not give uh, aspirin to children with a viral infection because uh, it causes Ray's syndrome, right? But here. You have to remember that although these all the symptoms look like a viral infection, but still we are going to give them uh, aspirin to decrease that inflammation and thus uh, decrease the chance for this MI. Uh, IV glo gamma globulins can also be given to such patients. So our next disease is Burger's Burger disease, I guess. So, it is also known as thromboangiitis obliterans. Thrombo means thrombus, angiitis is angies, blood vessel inflammation, and obliterans is to ob obliterate. So, one thing uh, that you need to remember in this case for the whole disease is eating a burger with along with cigarette, smoking a cigarette, and ended up the person his she uh, he or she ended up burning his or her finger. So. If you remember this, you can remember a lot of these things. So we can see that since it is a cigarette, you can remember that it is a T cell hypersensitivity reaction to smoke modified self antigens. And similarly, we're going to have this classic age group, uh, age group or the classic group of people that are affected by this disease are going to be heavy cigarette smokers. And the clinical uh, manifestations are due to uh, the Raynaud's phenomena and th this will lead to auto amputations and gangrene and ulcers etc. So we're done with most of the part of uh, this disease. So coming back to what it is basically it is a segmental thrombosing acute and chronic inflammation of intermediate small and medium, medium sized arteries. So since it is segmental, this is another thing that you need to remember about this. Segmental means that there are going to be different lesions. Some of them are going to be acute and some are going to be late. And there, there are three phases in these lesions. So these phases can be described as uh, whatever T cell hypersensitivity is going on. First of all, we are going to have neutrophils that are going to form micro abscesses. Now these abscesses are not infected. These are simply the pus that is formed by neutrophils when they die. This micro abscesses are going to be surrounded by mm, granulomatous inflammation because of course any in immune complex or any um, foreign agent such as cigarette smoke when it cannot be removed from the body, the body forms granulomas, right? So these mi micro, micro abscesses are then going to be surrounded by granulomatous inflammation and then we are going to have vascular fibrosis so by this we can understand that there are going to be 
two types of lesions acute and late lesions acute uh, lesions are going to have neutrophilic infiltrates with mural thrombi containing micro abscesses giant cells secondary nerve and vein involvement as i said in the first phase and then the late lesions are going to have thrombus organization and recanalization the clinical manifestations are nodular phlebitis because a phlebitis is simple uh, venous inflammation okay so nodular because it is segmental and it has two types of lesions okay so one thing to remember about this disease is this mnemonic and the second thing to remember is segmental and then you can make up these two points lastly the uh, treatment of this disease is by prostaglandin analog, uh, prostaglandin analogs and smoking cessation, of course. Okay, so the last type of vasculitides are going to be large vessel vasculitides. The first one is temporal or giant cell arteritis. Now, it is called temporal because temporal artery is usually involved in this type of vasculitis, and it is called giant cell because giant cells are uh, going to be seen under multinucleated giant cells are going to be seen in histology what it is basically it is focal granulomatous inflammation chiefly of the um, branches of the carotid artery okay so we're going to have cranial problems in this so we are going to have temporal artery involvement ophthalmic artery involvement etc so when we have temporal artery involvement we're going to have a headache jaw claudication uh, these two symptoms are going to be due to temporal artery involvement and ophthalmic artery is going to be uh, causing visual disturbances and if this disease is not treated it is going to cause blindness permanent blindness another symptom is also polymyalgia rheumatica which are simply flu-like symptoms okay so it can also involve aorta which is a large vessel and it, it is going to be called giant cell aortitis what causes this disease is a t-cell mediated immune response to antigen in vessel wall the same mechanism the most common age group is uh, the adults over the age of 50 and females are more affected than males so what happens is that since it is focal since this vasculitis is focal that is it is going to focus on a certain point for example if there is arteritis here there there won't be uh, anything in between these two dots so if i take a biopsy from here then th i won't see um, any art uh, vasculitis right so i cannot uh, i cannot exclude disease if i take a biopsy of the wrong place okay so negative biopsy will not exclude disease if you take biopsy of here there is nothing wrong here so that's what it means and under uh, histology we can see that there is nodular vessel thickening because it is focal same as before it is going to be granulomatous inflammation giant cells because giant cell arteritis internal elastic lamina will be fragmented and whenever this undergoes fragmentation and smooth muscle destruction then we are prone to aneurysms the treatment of this disease is low dose steroids to re reduce the inflammation so lastly we have takayasu's arteritis and this is also known as pulseless disease the reason being that this classically affects the aorta at its branch points and aorta at its branch points uh, you know that it supplies the head and the upper limb so uh, if there is a problem in that there is going to be a problem with the pulse uh, either there, there will be very um, a very feeble pulse or none at all and that's why it's called pulseless disease there can also be difference in the uh, systolic blood pressure between the both both the arms okay the classic age group is the adults less than the year, uh, age of 50 years old and young asian females is the uh, classic group arteriography can be used to diagnose this disease and as i said their clinical manifestation is going to be loss of pulse in upper extremities systolic blood pressure difference uh, greater than 10 millimeter of mercury between arms and retinal hemorrhages since the head is also head and uh, optic vessels will also be affected so the morphology it is indistinguishable uh, from GCA that is giant cell arteritis 
and involves irreg irregular vesicular, vascular thickening, intimal hyperplasia, granulomatous inflammation, giant cells, and medial destruction. Treatment is the same as GCA, that is, steroids. That's all about vascularities.